Sheila Wildman. I'm Associate Director of the Health Law Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to today's lecture in our Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. It's my special honor uh, to introduce today's speaker, Kim Tate. Many of you know Kim, at least by reputation. Uh, she's right out front among this law school's most beloved, brave, brilliant, no bullshit alumni. <laughs> She makes a habit of making trouble, or making trouble public. Kim graduated from Dalhousie Law School in 1984. Since 1992, she's been an executive director of the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies. Elizabeth Fry, as many of you know, engages in individual and systemic advocacy on behalf of marginalized, victimized, criminalized, and institutionalized women and girls particularly those who are or have been in prison. As Executive Director of EFRI, Kim has played a key role in a number of high-profile inquiries into the conditions of women in prison. Two important examples are the 1996 Arbor Inquiry into certain events at the Prison for Women in Kingston, and more recently, the Ontario Coroner's Inquest into the death of Ashley Smith. Kim also works doggedly day to day to ensure that the interests and perspectives of criminalized and marginalized women are represented forcefully at the sites where they're most directly placed in jeopardy. Kim works well with others. She's been a friend to many women caught up in the justice and prison systems when they've otherwise been most alone. She's also been instrumental in building coalitions across the country with other equality-seeking women's groups and social justice organizations to pursue coordinated approaches to systemic discrimination and violence against women. Kim has recently built upon her broad experience and expertise working with women in the justice and prison systems through postgraduate work in the area of forensic mental health. I believe we'll hear something of her hard-won insights in that regard uh, today. Last words, in 2003, Kim received Dalhousie Law School's Weldon Award for Unselfish Public Service, now she was School of Law, and in 2009, she received the Canadian Bar Association's Touchstone Award for furthering equality in the legal community in Canada. In 2012, she received an honorary doctorate from the University of Ottawa. She's a part-time professor in the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law. But this coming week, our students are so lucky uh, to have her delivering an intensive course on prison law here. So now, please join me in welcoming Kim Tate. Thank you. Thank you for that very generous introduction. And um, if my daughter was here, she'd be saying, oh, if they don't, really don't know you, though. So, so I have an almost 15-year-old daughter who some of you heard about yesterday, and some of you know, and you know how that sort of goes. So it keeps you, keeps you clear on how really well you don't do things. So, um, But I want to start by um, the way I always start, which is by acknowledging the traditional territory on which we have the privilege of being, beautiful territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and I live in Algonquin territory, otherwise known to many of you as Ottawa, unceded Aboriginal territory, and um, the importance for me of that has been brought home every day of the last almost 30 years that I've had the privilege and responsibility of walking in, but more importantly, being able to walk out of prisons for young people, for men, and for the last 22 years, as you heard, with, for, uh, with and for women and girls. And so um, it's very important that we uh, know that heritage, know um, the impact of it. Uh, today, though, I'm going to be speaking most specifically about the issues of women, uh, criminalization of women in particular with mental health issues. Everything I say um, applies in, to, obviously, men and young people as well. And, uh, but I, one of the things I really enjoy is to have a dialogue with you. So um, yesterday, the... the um, the audience was really animated, so it's a little competition. Those of you at law school, I know, likes competition. I don't particularly like competition, but for those of you who do and are here because of that, um, you can ask more questions today. So, because I would really like it to be, um, it, for me, it's always more interesting for me as well if um, I have some idea of some of the things people are wanting to hear. So, before I start, is there anything that you came really wanting to hear about that I can make sure that I incorporate? And before I get going, so anybody? Yes. Um, with the uh, with the inside onset of uh, the new super jails, um, what do you think is going? Where do you think that will be going? And um, the, uh, uh, the desensitization, if you will, of our society against putting people in jail. We we think that that's the answer, and obviously it's not working. Okay. So, um, 
much of what I'll say will cover some of those sorts of areas, but if I don't speak specifically to it, please stick your hand up and ask me to uh, answer that again. Yes? Uh, the quality of access to health and health services uh, for prison populated generally women in particular compared to general population. Okay, so again, uh, part of that will be part, but if, again, if I don't cover it fully, <coughs> anybody else? Yes. Um, this is about um, prisons being the new asylums. Um, we do go too much into the mental health issues that are not being dealt with by our society outside of the jail system, which Yes, so that's actually my, my en entry point, so that's great. Anything else? Okay, so anything else I can say is just fine, otherwise you'll, you'll let me know. Um, so women are the fastest, as many of you know, um, the women are the fastest growing prison population in this country particularly indigenous women, other racialized women, and women with mental health issues. And I'm going to focus in particular today on some of the issues that we've been working with uh, and on with respect to mental health issues. And some of you know very clearly, some of you, many of you here know far more than I do about some of the history of that. Um, certainly in Canada, the deinstitutionalization, the progressive trend to get people out of institutions was really interrupted and um, and and really started the trend towards prisons being the new asylums um, when we deinstitutionalized but did not appropriately resource communities or where resources were set up in communities as we saw the elimination of some of the national standards around health care um, and social services, we saw the elimination or the <coughs> diminishment of those resources. So we either had some that were diminished or we didn't have sufficient to start out with. And so we know that the history of not having sufficient resources in the community is part of what has contributed to the increased criminalization and institutionalization of uh, in prisons of people with mental health issues. And so that's the starting point from which I come. If anybody wants to challenge that, I'm happy to have that discussion, uh, both here and in other, um, in other sectors. But I, I do want to talk a bit about what we've learned over the past little while because of some of the issues around um, health care or the lack of health care and the lack of access to health care within both the communities and in the prisons. And this for me started, um, and our organization really started in the, in the early 90s, about the same time as I was starting with the organization. We started to see a growth of the number of women in isolation, in segregation at what was the only federal penitentiary for women in the country then, the prison for women in Kingston. And what we saw was a, a number of women in um, segregation who were really there because they had both mental health issues and a number of them also had intellectual disabilities. And the other striking thing, and having been from, you know, admittedly a, come from away, but, you know, feeling like I was part of the Maritimes after being here and my, um, I just have to say that my dad's from PEI, so, you know, I sort of claim some linkages here. Uh, but um, one of the things we noticed was there was an overwhelm, the, the majority of the women in that category were from the Maritimes. And at that time, 13 women were serving federal sentences from this whole, from all four uh, provinces in the Atlantic region. And so, and there were seven of them with significant mental health issues. And so something didn't fit together, right? And so, um, so we decided to come and visit um, what was, and in 1995, paid a visit to um, Newfoundland to try, because many of them were from, in, from Newfoundland. We didn't have an Elizabeth Fry Society at the time there. There was a new group trying to start up. Um, but we were invited over to try and figure out what we could do about this. What was striking to me was it is the one and only time in the entire time of my nearly 30 years of doing this work that I was welcomed into a jail with cameras. I, I can't do a Newfoundland accent, so my apologies to those, but I'll try. It's like, my dear, bring those cameras on in here and have a look at what we're doing to these women. And, um, and I thought, you know, okay. So we went in. And what, what the fellow showed me, was the man who was at the time, he was about to retire, so he probably felt a bit safer than some of them might um, doing that. But what he showed was that a hall, what had been essentially a hallway in the um, downstairs part of the courthouse in St. John's had been converted into the jail part for the women. So women didn't go to Her Majesty's Penitentiary, as it's referred to, the provincial jail. Uh, they went to this basement area. And it was literally a corridor that had been turned into a couple of cells and when I was there, there were a few women there, but there had been as many as 11 women in this very small area. No um, light, because it was a hallway that had been converted. And, and the day that I visited, he said, um, he said, did you hear the news? That, and so I'm not going to continue to try and do a Newfoundland accent. Um, but 
He said, did you see the news today? And I, I, I said, well, I saw some. What? And he said, did you notice they're closing another wing of the Waterford? Now, many of you will know that the Waterford Hospital is a psychiatric hospital in St. John's. And he said, and of course they're closing the, whim, the wing where most of the women are. And I said, and why do you think that is? He said, because they won't complain. And my dear, they may as well take a truck over there, load it up, because this is where they're coming. And so he very clearly was seeing what they, that what we were seeing was a situation where when all of the other resources are being shut down, the only place that can't say, sorry, our beds are full, sorry, you don't fit our mandate, sorry, we just don't have room for you right now, and, and really, this is not the best place for you. If you can be charged with something, and so just charged can get you held, it shouldn't be that way, but as those of you who practice know very well that if... Um, if you can show that the person might be a risk to themselves or to commit another offense or, to, or just, you know, the, the, the sort of um, really patriarchal notion that we're caring for the um, people if we keep them in custody means that we'll see many people kept in custody awaiting trial or um, on the basis of charges just because there's a fear that if they're released into the community, it may be more dangerous for them. So we see increasing numbers of people coming into the system. When I met with the judges, they said the same thing. We went through even including the mental health workers, and when we talked to the mental health workers in the community, they said, we are being told not to take people. We are, have so many. We are so oversubscribed. We only take the people who are motivated, and if they cause any trouble, and particularly if they do anything that, for which we could call the police, we're told to call the police so that they can be dealt with somewhere else. And so we saw fairly, very quickly the trend that now is, is very much across the country. It's not that it wasn't happening across the country then, but we saw it, I think, most profoundly there. Why? Because we saw some of the economic downturn um, most profoundly, most, most evidently and starkly there first, but we've now seen it across the country. So what has that led to? Well, it's led to more and more people in the system it's led to a system that is already overloaded, particularly the women's system, um, struggling to try and address the needs of women with mental health issues and com other complex issues in an environment where behavior is seen through the lens of criminality um, first and foremost. And so any behavior that is seen as in any way aberrant or not, uh, stepping out of the norm gets characterized in that way. And it's a system where the way that you monitor people who cause you the greatest challenges is to put them in the very environment that is most likely to exacerbate any mental health issues you have, and that's isolation. And so we've seen a default to not just prisons, but in particular isolation and um, an aggravation and exacerbation of mental health issues for, for individuals, uh, all the more so, I would say, for women, um, but certainly the, the, what I'm saying applies to men. It's just that um, it's been... You know, it, the last time I was in a men's penitentiary was almost three years ago. So, you know, I, I don't presume to say that I know everything that's happening in the men's prisons. I hear from people, and I still keep in touch with some of the men I've known over the years. But um, certainly this is true in the women's prisons. And so, so we started to um, do a number of things, one of which some of you are aware of and, and um, some of you have been involved with is the, uh, everything from human rights uh, complaints, complaints to the United Nations. We've worked with the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, and some of you will know he recently, uh, Juan Mendez recently said that, any, that to put anybody with mental health issues in um, isolation is wrong. It should not happen. And that he, even though he doesn't support use of isolation for anybody, 15 days is a maximum that he would see uh, for putting people in. So no young people, no people with mental health issues. And yet it still is the default in our prison system. Um, it's also, if, if you're not in that system, in our women's prisons, um, our pr federal penitentiaries for women, in the mid-90s they developed mental health units. And in fact, Professor Waldman did a, an, what still stands as a high watermark of the analysis when she was uh, working with Archie and uh, Professor Kaiser and uh, here, as a high watermark of really an analysis of why that can't work, why trying to put a therapeutic environment into a prison is ineffective. Not the least of which is what I've already said, but also those, those mental health units were all put in the areas of the prison that are for minimum and medium security women. There are no medium, minimum security um, institutions for women, really, in this country. Uh, there's been one outside the, uh, the prison built in Edmonton just recently, and there's supposed to be more being built, houses built outside the prisons, but there aren't minimum security. So they're in the medium security part of the institution, 
um, and therefore not accessed. Why do you think they're not accessed if they're in the medium security part of the institution? Any guesses? Well, there are th three ways that you can be classified as maximum security in our federal penitentiary system. Um, so those of you who are in the, uh, how many of you are in the prison law class that I'm doing next week? Okay, so you, you can just for, take a mental vacation when it comes to this part of the course. So there are three ways, and um, one is if you're, um, what, whatever you come in on. So if you come in on a serious offense, murder, a serious violent offense, you're likely to be classified as maximum security. If the day that you're assessed, the, your um, perceived risk to the community, no matter what you are convicted of, is high, you're seen as a high risk to the community, so whether it's because you might escape or you might be released on that day, then you will be classified as maximum security. And the third way that you can be classified as maximum security is how you adjust to an institution. And you can imagine the individuals with mental health issues don't adjust well to an institution. I facetiously often say, for us, the worry is usually the people who do adjust well to institutions, but that's neither here nor there. In this context, anybody who comes in with a significant mental health issue does not adjust well, usually is almost, well, not usually, is almost immediately classified as maximum security, therefore ends up in the maximum security part of the institution, which is also a segregated area by law. Um, you have either general population where you can mix with everybody, go to the gymnasium, go to the gym, go to programs, or you have segregation. So in every one of the federal penitentiaries in this country, not only do we have segregation units that are called segregation, but segregation is a status, not just a place, that you also have, because of the way maximum security units are operated, they are also segregation units. So you're, you're damned either way if you're someone coming in with mental health issues because you're likely to be classified as higher security, and if on the day you're coming in you happen to be having um, any kind of episode that is seen as problematic to the staff in terms of management, you're likely not only to then be maximum security, but also be placed in segregation. So that caused us to start to do some work around how do we challenge some of that. And we, we've been trying to challenge it through all kinds of means, not the least of which is to try and get federal and provincial and territorial bodies to be talking about what they need to put in place so that um, individuals are not kept in those institutions. And there are discussions underway. I'm told that, in fact, the head of women's corrections is going to be here on Monday um, having that kind of discussion with the Burnside um, folks and the, um, the Nova Scotia Hospital people to try and have um, some contracts set up so women could go there. To a woman, I would say to a man as well, but my most recent experiences have already, uh, as is really evident to you now, um, is with women. But to a woman, every woman we have managed to get out of prison into a mental health facility, even a locked forensic unit, I'm ashamed to say. If I, was, if I had ever thought I would be advocating for that when I was here, or even, even now it, it sends chills up my spine, the spine sometime. But even locked forensic units within 24 hours do immeasurably better. For one main reason is in those facilities, their behavior is then seen through the lens of their mental health label. Whether or not we agree with that label, it's seen through that label. And so their behavior is no longer seen as just bad behavior or criminal behavior, but is seen through that lens. And so even though there are, there are um, things happening in those institutions that we sometimes disagree with, um, the reality is they tend to start to improve. And every single one of the women um, that we've managed to get into those sorts of institutions have started to be able to integrate into the community. And a couple of them have been out now for several years, one out for 15 years um, in the community with supported, uh, it, sometimes supported independent living, sometimes familial support. Uh, and these are women who previously had been described in much the way Ashley Smith was, as incapable of living anywhere out of an institution, which is um, how, how she came to be described. So... Um, one of the things we're, we're doing to try and do that, in addition to one case-by-case -case, um, uh, analyses and, and advocacy, is working with doctors and um, nurses and doing training with them. Obviously, these sorts of um, uh, venues and opportunities are also incredibly valuable. But trying to get people to become more aware of what is happening, in, in a, especially amongst the public, because there is a perception that going to jail and being helped is, even, is better than just being left in the community. And if there's anybody here who has, still has that notion at the end of today, I want to sit with you. And I'm sadly to say, well, I won't, I won't tell you I won't let you go until you have a different view. But um, <laughs> if you still have that view, I will be surprised. And 
Because in the process in particular of going through the inquest into Ashley Smith's death, um, it has become evident to me how little we even know. And when I say we, me personally and our organization knew about how some of these issues were understood within the prison. And when you've been doing this for as long as I have and something can still surprise you um, in a very bad way, um, it's, it's scary, it's disconcerting, and it prompts you to want to do something about it. Um, and what really surprised me is we've been doing human rights training in the prison since, um, since the early part of uh, la the last decade after we did the human rights uh, complaint in 2001 and that was reported on by the Canadian Human Rights Commission in 2004. The women at that stage said, we don't want another report. You know, there will be another report. But what we really want is the tools to be able to do something about this. You come in and wander through the institution. We do walks through the entire institution, look at the conditions of confinement, document them, meet with the women, meet with the administration, try to address the issues. And, but then we leave. And it's clear that for every other minute of every other day, of every other week, of every other year, um, those women are there at, really with individuals who are in the prison who may or may not understand what's happening. And so the women said, we want training on our, what our human rights are, what our charter rights are, what our rights are under the Corrections and Conditional Release Act so that we know what, when things are going wrong. So we started to do that training. And in 2008, our, our 2007, sorry, our membership decided that women across the country deserved an equal level of advocacy, whether they were in uh, Nova Institution out in Truro or in the Fraser Valley Institution in Abbotsford in British Columbia. And so they decided to do something which is really unprecedented in our organization because we're a grassroots organization, mm -hmm. is they wanted to um, have all of the organization of the regional advocates come under our office, the national office, and the training happen out of our national office. Um, and so that's what we've been doing since 2007. It coincided with, in fact, it was seven years ago yesterday that Ashley Smith came into the federal prison system, and it was six years ago, um, two weeks ago, that she died in the federal prison system. And so it coincided with um, Ashley Smith being in the institution, but it wasn't driven by that. Some people think that we changed it because of that. I wish I could say we, we did. We have changed lots of things as a result of Ashley, how Ashley was um, d uh, treated, and I don't mean treated in a positive sense of the word, um, in prison, but that was one that we were in the process of changing. Had we been doing something different, uh, had we been doing what we're doing now then, I would like to think something different would have happened because we have been able to intervene in other women's cases. But as I'll talk about in a minute, um, that's not always true. Uh, but one of the things we have uh, learned through this process is how little staff knew as well. And so our training now also includes staff, and I'll explain a bit about that. And so um, I'm going to, and I'll Warren, these are, not, um, these are not pictures of Ashley strangling herself. They are, I find them disturbing, but they're not going to be um, the ones of, that you've heard of or that have been shown live streamed. And I want to say uh, for a minute, the reason you're seeing these pictures is because Ashley's family had the courage and the tenacity to um, insist that if they didn't understand what had happened to their daughter, uh, nor could anybody else probably, and so they insisted that all of these images, all of the proceedings of the inquest be aired publicly. And so right now, if you um, turned on, you, if you Googled um, Ashley Smith inquest live stream, you could be watching the proceedings that are happening right now. They'd still be going on right now in, um, in Toronto in the inquest. And so, um, and part of the other thing that happened is something that I would never have predicted when I was sitting in the seats. Well, they, they were not these seats, but as I said yesterday, much nicer seats now at the law school than, but, you know, but it was, um, when I was here, um, we would, I would not have predicted I would get as much information from staff as I get. Um, all of the information that I've been able to get about what happened to Ashley has either been through our court case. We had, some of you know, we had to go to the federal court twice, even though Ashley had given her authorization twice to us to get her files. Uh, I met her, uh, unlike many of the women who I've worked with, I didn't know Ashley very well. I only met her in person twice. I talked to her on the phone a number of times. Um, but when I met her, she asked that we get her file information and assist her with what was happening to her. We did do that, um, but in fact, we never got the information. And the corrections delayed and delayed and delayed getting her information to us, and then eventually tried to use the excuse of her death as a refusal to give us the information. We ended up having to go to the uh, federal court twice to get that information. 
and untold resources. I went without staff. Um, there are two of us usually in our office went without staff for almost three years to do that. And so you can imagine if you're a prisoner wanting to access your records, how difficult it would be when we had me with legal training, we had two lawyers working pro bono with us, and we had people working inside trying to assist us, and we had the, the um, privacy commissioner rule in our favor and went to the federal court, and still it took us almost five years to get some of the documentation. I got the videos through other sources. Let me just leave it at that. And um, the reality is that is part of how we managed to get them released because I have not yet seen the inquest brief. So imagine those of you who are practicing, those of you who are law students, the significance of this is that we have standing at the inquest. Our organization, the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies, has standing at the inquest. As part of that standing, I've signed a release saying that if I access any of the material through the inquest process, I can't do anything with it, basically. I'm precluded from using it for any other purposes for the inquest. So I have signed that, but we have two letters have gone, because there have been two different coroners involved in this process, two letters that have gone to the coroner outlining that it, even though I have signed that saying that if I accessed it, I wouldn't release it, I have not yet accessed the inquest brief. So everything I'm going to show you has either been made public um, through other means or most of the videos I first saw and then did affidavits about their existence to try and get them released into, um, into the public sphere through the inquest process or through other processes. And um, some of you know that um, that can be a little risky at times because the first challenge from corrections was they don't exist. There's no such thing whether it was the forcible, some of the forcible confinement, some of the, um, the pepper spraying, the forcible injections, all of those, some of the excessive uses of forces as well. And so our response was, then you prove that they don't exist. Show us the, all of the videotape you have of her for that period of time to prove it doesn't exist. And the long and short is, um, obviously, that couldn't exist. And so what I'm going to show you is um, some of the the stills we have and some of how um, Ashley and talk a bit about how Ashley was described during those processes as well as another um, another couple of women's um, cases that we're working on. So Ashley was described as almost constantly out of control, a risk to public safety, a risk to herself. And this particular incident you can see, can you, uh, can you see it all right with those lights? So this she was described as this was an emergency situation where she was violently out of control and required the emergency response team to come in and first pepper spray her and then take her out and then involuntarily transfer her across the country. Um, I leave it to you to determine whether in fact you see that as an out of control behavior, whether you see that as someone requiring the kind of force that is, is clearly being applied here. You can see that she's fully shackled as, in, as well as being cuffed to the front. So she has a belly chain on, she has a chain going down to her legs, her ankles are chained together, and she's cuffed to the front. And they're getting ready to, and they've got, um, they've got gas masks on and they're getting ready to move her. Uh, one of the challenges we have said to corrections is if there is one videotape of Ashley Smith actually being violently out of control, it would have been produced by now. She has now been dead six years. There is not one. And if you doubt that, please get in touch with Commission Council, get in touch with any of them, and ask for the proof of the violent, out-of-control behavior. What she did do was swear. What she did do was taunt. What she did do was tell them when they were doing things illegal. What she did do was document some of the things. And so that led to her writing materials being taken away, her reading materials being taken away, <coughs> her being done, denied access to others, and her being treated in a way that was really about um, stopping that behavior, but really what it did was escalate the very behavior. And I go back to, um, she was at this stage uh, 19 years old, but operating very much. She, had gone in, she went into prison as a 15-year-old, and she was still operating emotionally in many of the ways. As I watched the videotapes, I see the behavior that is strikingly similar. Now, my daughter will be here next week for a take care kid to school or work day. Um, so, you know, don't tell her I said she acts like that. Like that. But, so that she, but, but truly, some of the things that come out of her mouth and some of the things she says and some of the ways she challenges, I would argue, as much as I don't like them at times and I find them challenging and sometimes I am not creative enough to think of really good ways of addressing them, they are normal behaviors. They are not abnormal, aberrant, 
um, requiring punishment types of behaviors. And yet, um, in a different context, I could see a mouthy, stroppy young woman like my daughter being treated in much the same way when she challenged authority or told them they were wrong or what they were doing was against her rights or that they were stupid or they didn't know what they were doing or that they're weird. Sorry, now I'm talking about what my daughter says about me. <laughs> but, so that's, but, but you get the picture. So her behavior, um, was she was not someone who, who bowed to authority very easily and I would say legitimately didn't bow to authority very easily given what was happening to her. And the more that they treated her in a, a way that demanded her to be cowed by and bow to authority, the more she resisted it. This was, uh, some of you have um, seen or may have, did any of you watch the prisoner transfer videos of her being transferred? So this was actually being transferred from the Regional Psychiatric Center in Saskatoon to Joliet Prison in Quebec. Now, those of you who have traveled across the country, how long does it take you to take that travel? across the country? Four or five hours. It depend this, this was a police plane. It took almost five hours. Partway through the trip, she says she has to go to the bathroom. There are five staff on the, on the plane, two RCMP officers flying the plane. It's an RCMP flight. She is chained to the chair by her arms and by her feet. So she is locked into her seat, and she has a seat belt on. And she asks to go to the bathroom, and they say, wait. She asks to go to the bathroom, they say, wait. She asks to go to the bathroom, they say, wait. Then she starts to try and unbuckle her seatbelt. And they get mad, and they start to physically hold her arms down. Now, she has a range of motion of about five inches at that stage. And then they, they cuff her hands together in the front. So she still has a little range of motion, and she can still reach her seatbelt. And so she starts to irritate them by repeatedly unbuckling her seatbelt. Now, remember how she is in the seat. There is no illusion on anyone's part, I would suggest, that she is going anywhere. She's not getting out of that seat. She's chained to the seat. But she continues to do it, and eventually they, they get um, upset and tell her that she, they're going to duct tape her to the seat if she doesn't stop. She goes to the bathroom in, in her, um, as you can see, the prison uniform. Um, she goes to the bathroom, and they start to taunt her and tease her about how she stinks and smells like a pig and how... And she starts to swear at them and yell at them. And first, they put a spit hood on her, which is designed... She has spit, and she... Well, I never... We haven't seen videos of it, but she had said to me at times she would try to spit or would spit in the direction of staff. So they put a spit hood on her. It seems clearly from the video that they're putting it on because they're annoyed with her, what she's saying to them when she's speaking back to them when they're taunting her. And when she um, continues to play with her seat belt, they put a second spit hood on, and the, uh, the pilot comes back and further um, duct tapes her, her arms and feet and, and has her fully duct taped to the seat. Heaven help us if there had been an emergency, but let's not get there. Um, do that. And when, when she, you hear her say in a very plaintive voice, you know, uh, he says something like, now behave or it'll get worse. She says, how could it possibly get worse? You hear him say, I'll duct tape your face. And you never hear another word from her for the entire transfer. So when we're talking about transfers, we're talking about transfers that are being done in ways that not only breach the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, her human rights, the char rights, but breach everything around, you know, air, you know, basically how you try to supposed to transfer prisoners, period, and some of the um, provisions about what happens when you're in an airplane and how you can how you can be um, dealt with in an airplane in a medical emergency even, for instance. So this is her in the trans prison transfer. And you know, some of you know that she was transferred 17 times in the 11 and a half months that she was in federal custody. Is there a, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. is no, there no. a regulation that there has to be a female accompanying females when they're transferred in that situation? Um, there's supposed to be, for, um, frontline staff are supposed to be women working with them, but as long as there, are, there is at least one woman, there can be men. And routinely with Ashley, there was sometimes one woman, sometimes more, but uh, there'd be staff. So yes, there is, I mean, we have argued that should be all, bless you, should be all women working on the front line, but um, there aren't at this stage. And this, most of them were men, but there were two women. Oh, yeah. In That's right. So this, some of you have heard about the involuntary um, treatment, the forcible injections that happened at Joliet. I didn't, so one of the points to come back to that I mentioned, I did not hear about 
the involuntary treatment from Ashley. So when I talked about some of the things we've learned is we've learned to ask better and more probing questions. Because when I asked about things like transfer, she told me about, when I asked about treatment, when I asked about um, uh, whether she was dealt, you know, whether other um, things were breached, I didn't have the wit to ask, did they ever give you an injection that you didn't want? Because there was no record of her um, uh, being given injections other than when she had been committed under mental health uh, legislation, and usually the rules should be followed. We now know, in fact, routinely the rules are not followed. Routinely in prison settings, what happens is a call is made to a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists may not ever even clap eyes on the prisoner. Call is made saying someone is out of control. So in this context, this is the fifth injection that she got in this series over a couple of days at Joliet Institution. But in this context, the, the nurse, this nurse that you can see in the gas mask, um, calls in and says she is out of control, she's psychotic, she's a danger to herself, she's a danger to everybody else. There's no evidence of that in the video, that we have, any of the videos that I watched of over 30 hours of her being monitored by video camera by the staff. Um, but he, he authorizes not one, but five injections during that period of time and never sees her, violates all of their, I mean, there's a reason that the doctors have a phalanx of lawyers at the inquest right now because not just at that institution but at a number of others, doctors authorized injections on the basis of the staff reporting of her being out of control. And then... They would, uh, they would start the proceedings for committal proceedings. So those of you working in around prisons, watch for this. They start the proceedings and then abandon them before they need the second signature of a psychiatrist. Or they just continue to start a new process each time. And so that was something we weren't fully aware of, that we are aware of, that we're now doing both training with, um, with physicians, but also doing work with, um, within the correctional system to say, you, you know, this can't be happening and your contracts have to clearly outline what the responsibilities of um, doctors and physicians are and nurses when they're in this position. This one, um, so Corrections has grudgingly agreed, um, and well, I should, that, to be fair, some have agreed the minute they saw these videotapes that this, this was involuntary and illegal, or at least unlawful. And some have grudgingly accepted um, after it's been produced at the inquest. There are many within Corrections, including the lawyer, some of the lawyers involved, who still argue that this particular injection was a, is still, they would characterize as voluntary treatment. Why do you think? She's smiling. She's actually in the video. You can't really tell from here. She offers up her arm. So it's described as she clearly was okay with it. The, she, the nurse is saying to her, you know, we're going to give you another one. You may as well make it easy. And so she, she just smiles and offers up her arm and gets the injection. Now I ask you, does that look, what makes it not look voluntary to you? <laughs> She's handcuffed. Does the nurse look like she thinks that everything's safe here? <laughs> that she's voluntarily doing this in a gas mask? With the staff at the, you can't see, but they've got canisters of pepper spray at the ready to spray. The staff are fully suited in gas masks. But this to, so this will give you an example of something that still, for corrections folks, is described as voluntary treatment. They saw that as voluntary because she offered it up. In prison for women in 1994, the physician who did body cavity searches of women who were fully shackled described it as voluntary because they signed their name to a paper. So we have, some, we have an obligation, I would say, as individuals who are trained in the law to be identifying when things, just because they look like they may be lawful, aren't necessarily lawful. And, you know, Again, to those of you who are in prison law, but if you're not, you don't need to be a lawyer to, do, to understand this. What I say to whether it's law students, lawyers, doctors, heads of uh, prisons, or women or men or young people in prison is, the law is very clear. The penalty that's being imposed on you when you get a prison sentence is separation from the community. That's it. Anything that takes away your freedom any more than separating you from the community is either one, not allowed, or two, has rules about how it can be done, and three, you're entitled to know what those rules are. So that's all you need to know. So if those of you who are signed up for prison law, you can, if you remember that, you pass, and you don't have to take it to the course now. So, but in all seriousness, that it, is that, it is that 
simple and complicated, but it is that simple. Yes, you had a question. Okay. Does that statement that you're making now apply to the security certificates that are sometimes issued for prisoners? Do you mean um, for immigration? For security certificates are yeah. the security that they twist it and make it seem whatever they want, but. Um, you're saying that you have a right to know and all that kind of stuff, and they tell you no, you don't. That's right. Well, um, I'm not as inv I'm not involved at all in the security certificate, but I do know that the charter has been breached in many contexts there. So, um, in theory, at least, the rules should apply that. But very, my understanding is it's not being applied in those contexts. So, so that's volunt that's voluntary treatment. This was so. This was actually this is out of time from the previous one. This was actually just before the. Um, fourth injection, but I put it in here because one of the things that um, when I was challenging that there weren't actually incidents of her being violent or out of control, they said yes there was, there was, you know, before one of the injections she got out of her restraints and she was getting, you know, um, going to attack the staff. This is the incident. So she's actually still restrained. I don't know if you can see that she's, her hand is still down. She's still um, attached to, uh, she's in four point restraints, but they didn't have her head in the restraint. That would be the five point restraint. So they didn't have her head in the restraint. And at one point, she's uh, just before all of this happens, she's been asking for about eight hours for someone to change her tampon and because she's got her period and she's, she's wanting to be cleaned up a bit. And they're, at one point, they start joking, change it yourself, ha ha ha, you know, what, what are you going to do? Who cares? You know, you're here. And so, um, then they all leave the room, and she's in this small room, um, an observation room off the, near the near the, in the hospital unit at Joliet. And they leave the room, and she's calling out to them still and can't hear. The, she can hear that they're talking and laughing in the hallway, and you can hear that on the, the video. Um, and so she tries at, some, at one point to get up and manages to get up on her elbows somehow and is trying to look and see where they are. When they see that she's actually up, they say, she's getting up, and they run in. And they put her in a chokehold, as you can see, and shove her back down and then put her head in, back in restraint so she can't, that can't repeat itself. This is described on paper, not as a use of force, but as an intervention to just gain control when she was starting to get out of control, as a preventative measure. Now, by law, this is a use of force. Everything that's happening is a use of force. The restraints... The um, going in, having the pepper spray at the ready, but this is described as them just gaining control. When, when we started trying to intervene and said there are other things that Ashley really liked to do and that if they wanted to um, encourage a different behavior, this is before we you know, obviously knew all of this, we actually thought there may have been some incidents where she was getting out of control. Uh, but it was clear that she liked to write, she liked to read, she was uh, actually quite a good student and had plans to go on and thought she would do work working with poor people was what she wanted to do. Um, and so we encouraged them to actually give her some of her writing materials back. For a while they did give her crayons back. They never gave her anything more because they said they, she might hurt herself with them. Um, and, but this would be an example of some of the things that she would write about when she had the opportunity to write. This was actually done when she was much younger, when she was still in the youth system. But you give an idea of someone who was not just an anomalous, amorphous bag of rage, of danger to the public or to um, the people she was with, but a much more complicated young woman who we know likely would have responded much better had they provided more access to her family, had they been provided her with educational efforts. And in fact, as a result of this, Ashley's family, and I always want to give credit here, has uh, made a, a significant donation to the organization for a fund that allows us to fund any woman or girl who's coming through the system who wants to, um, wants to basically further their education and can't afford to. Now, those of you who have worked around the system know in 1992, all post-secondary education in the federal prison systems were cut, despite what you might have heard about Carla. Nobody, the government wasn't paying for an education. People have to pay for their own education. We have a small bursary. Um, things like this, me teaching here and doing speaking engagements, goes into a fund that we then use to provide bursaries and funding to women so they can pursue their education. And Ashley's family provided a sizable donation that means that every woman now would not be in a position that she was to not be able to afford to have a course unless they asked their family for the money or had the money independently. 
Uh, but nevertheless, the challenge is still to get that material into the prisons. And so um, one of the things Corrections has said, um, some of you will have heard, is that everything has improved since Ashley's death, that in fact things are much better and much further ahead. And if, if you're tempted to believe that, I'd encourage you to um, read this little report that was put out a couple weeks ago actually a month ago now, by the Office of the Correctional Investigator. The Office of the Correctional Investigator is an ombuds office that provides, um, that as an ombuds office does, will investigate issues that come up that are brought to their attention either by corrections, by prisoners, by families, by organizations like ours. And one of the things we'd ask them to look at is we were being told that much had changed. There had been an investment of resources for mental health services in the prisons since Ashley's death and that our contention public contention that things were worse, not better for women, needed to be challenged. And so we asked the correctional investigator to document because, as I've already mentioned, even though the rules are that we should get access to that documentation when women ask us to because they give us their releases of information, we routinely don't get access to that information. So we went to the other body, other than the Correctional Service of Canada that has access to all of it, the Office of the Correctional Investigator, and said, could you please monitor it? Thankfully, we didn't know this because they don't, con they don't account to us, they account to Parliament, uh, but w thankfully they actually also not only did that, but then provided a report. And in that report called Risky Business, an investigation of the treatment and management of chronic self-injury among federally sentenced women, they report that there were, at the time they issued this report, or at the time they did the report, eight women in much the same situation as Ashley was, and possibly as many as 20, but eight who they had fully documented, needed to be immediately out of the prison system. This is one of them. She died in October, on, on January 20th, 2013, in the Regional Psychiatric Center, the same place where I first tried to see Ashley and was denied access. We now know because she had just been assaulted at least three times. Uh, by staff and they did not want us to intervene and did not want us to see what was happening. And I was just there this week um, because a woman who, another woman we know, an Indigenous woman is facing a dangerous offender hearing on the basis of charges that have all arisen while she's in prison. Those of you who know Ashley's story will know that she started in the prison system. She was, on, she was arrested on a breach of probation and a shoplifting charge. They breached probation. She was on probation because she had assaulted with uh, crab apples a postal worker. Um, and when she went to prison, she then accumulated charges. And so by the time she died, she had a cumulative sentence of um, almost, more than six and a half years. One of the longest sentences she had in that period was 137 days. So she was accumulating charges. A lot of the Canadian public, a lot of people, a lot of lawyers don't know that you go to prison, you can then be charged further on the basis of what happens in prison. When I started doing this work coming out of here, that didn't happen very often. It had to be a very serious, very, very serious assault or a murder or a rape in a prison for charges to then be laid against a prisoner in, in criminal charges. And so there's also the notion um, we're, we're in the midst of trying to see if we can do some class action types of approaches on the whole issue of double jeopardy because of the number of people who accumulate charges. So this woman is one of the eight who is listed in this report, but she died in January. So this report was released September 30th. She died January 20th. And this is written up still as dangerous behavior. What do you think is dangerous about this when you look at the picture? Pardon me? She's larger than the officer. It's actually me with shorter, longer hair. But <laughs> A few years ago, so. But so, the dangerous behavior was actually me. I was cited for dangerous behavior in this. So, the dangerous behavior was that this was a woman. Her name is Canoe James. She said she wants her name used. Um, she is one of the women outlined. She is a woman who, when she came into the prison system, had um, no more than a grade three education. Was described as, um, she said, they tell me I'm stupid and fat and ugly and um, that. You know, basically I should go on a diet and I'll never be smart so I can't do anything. And her dream was not just to get a high school education but to go to university. And they told her, no, you can't. You, they basically said she had intellectual disabilities and fetal alcohol and she would never get an education. Uh, she spent most of her time in segregation in various prisons, was also transferred across the country. And in this, um, this is her graduation ceremony. She had the, we funded a number of courses um, and 
um, through the bursary process that I mentioned, she was able to get her uh, high school education. And to the credit, the everlasting credit, of a very um, lovely man who works as a teacher at the school at Grand Valley Institution. So she was in the same segregation unit that Ashley died in when uh, she was living there when this, this picture was taken. Um, he insisted that she should, like everybody else, have a graduation ceremony. Um, he was willing to do whatever this in, the institution wanted to make that happen, but they refused to let her participate in the graduation ceremony with the women in the general population, the minimum medium security women, because she was too much of a risk, too dangerous, and too volatile, they said. So he then set up that she would have a graduation ceremony inside and asked that um, a number of people uh, were asked to attend. In the end, they wouldn't allow anybody in because it was too dangerous a situation to allow that. She was only permitted to, to get her diploma if she was fully shackled. So I don't know if you can see here, but this, this is a handcuff. So she was shackled and she was cuffed to the front. And this is a bit of an awkward hug because that's how she had to be to be fully shackled and get a hug. And the dangerous behavior was we were not supposed to go near her. And what do you think is, what did I cause there? How did I cause a danger here? Side. Pardon me? Side hug. Side hug. And what would be the potential danger? Pardon me? That she could do something. Yeah, she could have headbutted. They didn't say, oh, good thing they didn't think of that. I would, that would have been really good. No, they didn't think of head, but what they said is she could have somehow twisted herself around and got those shackles up over my head. I'm taller than her, but, um, and she's, you know, so you can imagine she's even smaller than me, but somehow she could have twisted up, got those chains around, and strangled me. And so I put the entire institution at risk because that would have been a security incident. And that was written up as me putting the institution at risk and dangerous behavior. So, so it gets better. <laughs> she had seen movies and, um, and you know, uh, when people graduate, they throw up their mortarboards. And, you know, so the other thing she really wanted to do was to be able to throw up her hat and have a picture of it to send to her mom. So we, everybody agreed that she could do that but we had to stand 20 feet back for this picture to be taken. Why? All right. She might have flung that hat at us and harmed us. It was, I don't know if any of you have seen some of the ones. It's not like, you can get some really nice mortar boards for graduations around, but these are ones sort of like you have for kindergarten graduation. So, but nevertheless, that was the issue. And look at, she, you can, there you can see, can you imagine trying to throw it when you're shackled? And her range of movement would have been limited because she's also chained to her waist. So um, I've, that's why I call this educational opportunities and freedom to learn one of the things they said is once she started being able to get her education, her whole attitude changed. And, you know, gee, what a surprise. And she started, when she died, she was actually doing a university course. At, and she had asked to go to the regional treat, uh, psychiatric center because she wanted to get some treatment because she was told she needed treatment to get out of prison. When she was at the regional psychiatric center, she died of a heart attack. She started giving um, the staff and the nurses um, her symptoms 14 hours before she died. Why do you think she died of a heart attack? For me? Her symptoms were ignored and she was seen as just trying to get attention. So in this context, she, this has been described as her dying of natural causes. We're arguing that and we're actually fighting for an inquest right now into her death. And we have a lawyer for her counsel, for her family who's doing it pro bono. Um, and we have, we have a lawyer trying to get access and trying to get them to actually have an inquest because it's called natural causes because she died of a heart attack. She died of a heart attack, though, I would suggest to you, because she had mental health issues that meant that her symptoms, when she described them, were seen as her trying to get attention, not as her requiring medical attention. And in fact, they didn't go into her cell, to, the nurse didn't even go into her cell until she was probably dead. She was declared dead when they took her out to a hospital, but she was probably dead at least an hour before. And if it can possibly get worse, it gets worse because she was in a unit with 11 other women. And when we went in a few days after she died to meet with the women, because oftentimes the support that's provided is to staff, not necessarily to the women prisoners, 
we went in with our um, other Elizabeth Fry folks and some lawyers. Um, we heard that the women, and they, you know, fortunately have also advised the police of this, that the women were negotiating amongst themselves as to who should press their call buttons after she had pressed her call button repeatedly. Why do you think they were negotiating who should press their call button? Could be disciplinary action, but they were actually doing it because they said, we want whoever that they will actually come for to be the one to call. Now, can you imagine in that kind of situation, every having to try and figure out which one of us will they take seriously? Which one of us will they respond to? Which one of us has the responsibility of getting medical care for our sister prisoner? And that's essentially the role they were put into. So at every level, we are seeing a repeat of the very same issues that are being outlined uh, and, and uh, aired and publicly uh, provided to the Canadian public right now in Ash the inquest into Ashley Smith's death will re be replicated and even more so when you consider that in this case it was, Ashley's was a preventable death too. She was tying ligatures around her neck, yes, but she was on constant observation, five staff there, at least three cameras. She shouldn't have died. This woman was letting people know of symptoms of a heart attack 14 hours before she died. Could have, most physicians have said to us that they would almost guarantee she would have likely survived. Mm -hmm. So, what do we see as some answers? This is a woman who's actually from this community. Um, right now is in the hospital and she said I could, she is supposed to be doing a guest appearance in the course this next week, but depends how she's doing. This is a woman who is similarly described, and in fact, when she first heard of Ashley's death and heard the story of Ashley, she called me up. She calls me up every couple of days and, um, and said, I get it now. You thought I was going to be Ashley. She was in Spring Hill Institution several years, well, quite a few years ago, and um, the, when I saw her this one visit, I was sure that I probably wouldn't see her again. And she was charged with assault just before I had visited the institution. She had been charged with assaulting a staff member. And the, the benefit of her having been charged with assault was that, in fact, because she was charged with assault, they had to take her to outside court to, for the judge to hear that charge. And we were able to intervene to get her into the Nova Scotia Hospital for an assessment. And that started, uh, started a chain of events that has meant now she likely cannot be returned to prison because she's now recognized as having schizophrenia and requiring interventions, whether or not we like all the labels, but requiring mental health interventions. And she does end up in the hospital sometimes and goes back into the community and lives in indep supported independent living, supported by our Fry folks here and supported by mental health um, team here, as well as other individuals who are, have become her community of support. That is... She is one of the women who we talk about individually we've been able to get out of the prison system into mental health services. And it doesn't end there. We then have an obligation to continue to follow them so that any abuses that can happen in those systems don't persist. And in fact, are in the midst right now with Nova Scotia Legal Aid of looking into the potential of intervening, not in this woman's case, and we are already involved in hers, but in the case of some other women who are in for civil committals alone, not criminal committals, um, to try and argue that we need to be developing better community resources because these other two women who will be working on their cases are women who are being held in, in um, the mental health system under civil committals because there are no community-based resources. And that's just as unlawful and just as inappropriate and just as egregious a breach of the law, in my opinion, as, as are the other ones you've seen. So... Um, we're very, very keen to be working on this. We're very keen. Um, it's, to me, it's very exciting to be here um, this, this 10 days because I see incredible hope for, change, for things to change. Things are very, I would be, you know, obviously I have given you a very bleak picture of what's happening in the prison system. But let me try and inspire you with what, what is hopeful about this. Most of the information that I've received, I've mentioned, I get from people inside. Now, the negative side of that is people are feeling pretty hopeless inside if they're coming to people like me uh, to, for assistance. You know, we're a, a one or two women office. Um, there are, you know, 30,000 people working for the Correctional Service of Canada. They're asking us to bring human rights complaints. They're providing us with information. They're feeling impotent inside, but they are providing that information that helps us to be able to then take and challenge the system. As well, 
there are negotiations happening within uh, federal, provincial, and territorial um, working groups, and in particular in women's corrections, the head of women's corrections federally is very keen to push on this issue. And some of you, if you watched the, or saw any of the reporting of the testimony <coughs> of the Commissioner of Corrections uh, two weeks ago, he was on the stand right after I was, he reported that the only reason they do not have agreements is they do not have the funds. So he has essentially said, not essentially, he did say that he cannot fulfill his mandate. The Correctional Services of Canada cannot fulfill their mandate to have people in appropriate services because of lack of resources. So we're now in the midst of trying to get launched an Auditor General review of the Correctional Service of Canada and spending. Because you can rest assured when they need a plane to transfer someone across the country or they need monies to bring in an emergency response team or to have forceful injections, they have made money available. And so um, we're looking at that mechanism. And here there is the potential, those of you who are interested in this um, area, to work on some of these cases of not just Tona's but also some of the other um, women who will be working on their cases. So I think there is reason for great hope I, and I think the energy and the enthusiasm of people working within the system to change it is very real and it's shared by people both inside and outside of those institutions that there is a need for change. And so I think there is um, you know, great hope that that will happen. And I want to end with a, um, a quote because I want to, I'm just conscious of time. I want to make sure that there's time for more discussion for um, any of you who'd like to have more of that discussion or want to hear more about some of the recommendations the correctional investigator has made. Um, but, you know, I urge you, those of you who know this, um, someone said to me recently, what could we do? And I said, if the only thing you do is repeat two of the things you heard today to someone you don't know or someone you do know, but to repeat it and make sure people know and the ideas and the misconceptions of what is happening are challenged every day, that would be extremely helpful because I think most people don't know this is happening. It's happening in your name and it's happening in my name. And we all have a responsibility to challenge it. So um, the quote that I'm going to um, leave you with is one that was first given to me by another woman, a lifer, who I um, keep in touch with. Her name is Gail Horry. Some of you will know her because she challenged many um, issues, including the lack of education for prisoners in the, in the prison system. And it's a quote that she got from an Indigenous woman named Lilla Watson, who I've since had the privilege of meeting. She lives in Brisbane in Australia. And it goes like this. If you've come here to help me, you're wasting our time. If you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So I look forward to working with all of you. And, and that is... <laughs> Just about 10 minutes for some questions, if you want to raise some questions to Kim. Oh, what are you looking at? Oh, good. Um, this I took in Glasgow. I was there for a, a conference about women's imprisonment, international conference on women's imprisonment. And they just happened to have all the torture devices they've used to keep women quiet uh, over the years. And this is uh, Branks. Some, used to be called a scold's bridle by some, and it was basically to silence women who, you know, whether they were nagging their husbands or whatever, at a time when women had no rights. So it went in the mouth, and you couldn't talk if it was in because it would stab your tongue. And so, I'm not suggesting they bring these back, by the way. It was just, it was just a provocative picture that I, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going back into uh, your conversation with regards to extending time. I was just wondering if you could clarify a little bit more, because I know that prisoners can be charged under the Corrections Act regulation with assault. Um, it sounds like you're you're talking about being charged under the criminal, and so they're taken outside. Is that is that how the yes. time is being extended beyond what was given? Originally? Yes. Thank you for asking. I mean, it's why we would we say and and argue it's double jeopardy. We usually routinely put in grievances with the women about that. That they are so. Let's say. Um, Let's say as I'm being restrained, I strike out. Oh, actually, the most common is when I'm being strip searched. Women are disproportionately strip searched more than men. In fact, when we ask through access to information for the, the stats on how often women are strip searched, it's so often they don't keep track anymore. Can you imagine? The, the deputy wardens of women in this country wrote to the head of corrections, the commissioner of corrections, and said they should get rid of routine strip searches. So not yahoos like Kim Pei, but... The, wardens, the deputy wardens who were responsible for security of the federal penitentiaries for women said this, wrote in, said it, and um, when, they, uh, when they saw this, the, you know, the head of corrections 
I'm told, was not very happy. But they basically said it does nothing except promote hostility between prisoners and staff because many of the women, 91% of the Indigenous women, 86% of the women overall have histories of physical and or sexual abuse. And so, you know, they're being strip searched, they start to strike out. So if you, if you resist, you could get a criminal charge of resisting um, uh, arrest, if it, depending on what stage it is, assaulting a peace officer. And you'll likely then not only get punished by a higher security rating and possibly placed in segregation, but you'll also almost invariably all get an outside charge. What's called, and when you, when you hear the term outside charge, if you're going into a prison, that means they're being charged criminally and they'll be tr charged on the criminal code and they'll be processed in outside court, in the regular court, criminal court, and get receive additional sentence usually. So, for instance, Tona, she was when I first met her. She was in, um, she had done a B and E, had um, broken into a school after she had been being raped by her birth father. She was adopted out as a child, um, and from an indigenous from an indigenous family, mom she was adopted out. And when she went looking for her birth father, he um, let her stay with him, but proceeded to rape her. When she left, um, that she broke in that situation, she broke into school, was arrested. That was her first charge. By the time she left the Nova institution after serving, um, or Spring Hill and then Nova, um, she had served more than 10 years and she had accumulated those charges. And that was you know, more than 10 years ago now. So. And um, as, you, as I mentioned, Ashley has accumulated. There's another woman. Um, Canoe was serving a life sentence, so she just kept accumulating time that delayed her statutory release date. So if you're serving a life sentence, you can't, you know, despite what this government's doing, you can't serve more than a life sentence yet. And so, but it can change your release dates. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm interested in the initiative you described that involves um, bringing staff, frontline staff, within corrections and the conversation about promoting and respecting human rights. Um, I, I was interested in hearing a little bit more about that, how one would approach bridging that gap um, yeah. and making it a, a conversation of value. Yeah, um, it's a great question because when I first was suggest when we first started doing the human rights training, we would do a session for the staff the night before and then do a session for the women or two days of sessions with the women. And uh, that led to some interesting things. I say interesting because, so I'll tell you. It led to a couple of things. Like, for instance, I was accused of instigating riots, you know, trying to instigate riots, because I was telling women that they had rights and they didn't have to, um, you know, didn't, didn't have to follow rules as to how, as how it was heard by or interpreted by staff. I was... Um, I was told that I was actually taken hostage at one point because I refused to leave a situation because the women were upset and didn't understand a, a, uh, a direction that had been given, and so I was staying talking about it. So the long and the short was, you know, I started getting um, these sorts, of, this sorts of information, and staff were saying, sorry, I'll put that down so I can see you guys. Um, staff were saying that um, I was basically giving misinformation to uh, to the women, and so, and that our organization was, and so. Uh, that happened, and some of the women who were um, higher security uh, in the maximum security unit but were getting ready to be moved into the general population to the medium security um, were allowed to come to these, uh, were we were told they could come to the sessions if, in fact, staff could attend. So it left us with a real conundrum about what to do. And so we, we decided the way we've organized it is every, now we invite staff to participate, and, and we allow um, them to come into the to the meetings, hear all of the information, and then we can go into the small groups to develop the advocacy plans, which is a process that in the training of looking at what the actual issues are. They're private ones, so they're in small groups, and so staff aren't involved, or we have staff have their own one. Um, but it's led to some interesting things that I would never have predicted. So, for instance, in one of the institutions, the first one we did it, and I was had a lot of trepidation. One of the guys who was there, head of um, the uh, the supervisor for that day was in it, and he was an old fellow, I should say old, okay, it's probably my age, but anyway, he was, a, he, he was a more experienced guard, let's put it that way, who'd been around for a long time, had been at the prison for women, I'd known him for a bunch of years. I would have said he probably, you know, would have been a bit crusty around me and, and stuff, and, but he sat through the whole thing, and at the very end, um, when all the women had asked their questions, we'd had all the discussion, uh, at the very end, I said, so is there anybody else, and I looked to the staff, and I said, you know, you haven't 
spoken up, but if you'd like to. And then, I, and then he said, yeah, I'd like to say something. And I thought, oh, this is like, and I thought, okay, these are the moments. I make every mistake in the book, and I learn from those mistakes. And I thought, okay, now I'll ram my head into the wall. There's this, that was like not smart. But to, you know, uh, he stood up and he said, he said, now you people, if you say I said this outside of here, I'll say you're lying. And I'm thinking, oh, God, now what is he going to do? And he goes, you listen to this little lady. And, he did, and I'm going, and he met, you know, and, and he's, he's big guy, so he says, you listen to this little lady. He goes, I can't tell you that, but you've got to do it. You've got to stand up for your rights, and you've got to just fight it, and it's just getting worse and worse, and you just got to do it. And he says, so just listen to her. And then he said, but don't say I said that. And, <laughs> and I, I couldn't have said anything better. Like, it was, it was someone who, you know, he was, uh, you know, it, it was... One of the women described it as, excuse my language, but mind fuck when he did that. Because it was like, you know, like, but they heard it and said, okay, well, you know, they may not say it to our faces that they support what we're, that this is happening. And so it's led us to actually be even more vocal. So the, the, one of the last sessions I did at, in uh, British Columbia, the warden actually sat in and the management team of the institution. And then afterwards um, decided they wanted more training on what they should be doing around um, sections, how... Section 718-2E, the, what's often known as GLAD-2 factors, apply to parole and, and what they should be doing for all women as they're getting ready for parole. So it's led to some interesting and surprising um, developments. Um, this prison, so for instance, when the students go in next week, next Friday, the final day of the class is going to be in the prison, and um, the staff have all been, have been actually trying to change shifts to get in on the training, which is amazing to me. And so they hear what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. And many of them have said privately, um, you know, if you can imagine, I'm not in charge of the institution. When I walk into a seg unit, they're saying, we weren't going to let her do that. But is that legal? You know, I don't, I'm thinking, you know, so, you know, if it's not, and usually it's not, I'll say, no, it's not legal. You shouldn't be doing that. And, and so they'll often now apparently be writing up and saying, you know, this is, you know, we consulted a lawyer, and she says it's not legal. <laughs> I'm sure if they were, we consulted Kim Pate, they'd say tough shit. So, but you know, that's so. But there, uh, so it's been surprising, really surprising to me, and and yet um, is also has helped bolster the ability of some of the women to be challenging because there is being seen within um, not all staff, obviously, but it's being seen within as a as a more of an effort that we're all trying to work to get you out and, and you're trying to work to get you out and so I'm not saying it doesn't get used in a course of fashion in some some instances I'm sure it does but on the whole it's been a move in a in a more positive direction of you know being able to challenge staff and not have them um, be able to scapegoat the women or scapegoat our regional advocates or whatever so I think it's moved things along. Pardon me? Yes. Oh, oh so, yes. More? this is one of our regional advocates. So Nikki is our, one of our regional advocates here in this region. And yes, the, we're in the midst of reprinting the um, Human Rights in Action handbooks. They are on our website if anybody wants to access them. You're, anything that's on our website, feel free to use. It's, it's there for the using. And um, it gets copyrighted because some of our members feel strongly about that. But it doesn't mean you can't use it. Just use it. That's absolutely true. I mean, the women are the least likely to make complaints and grievances. And you may have heard through the um, um, what happened with Ashley as well. The very last grievance she did was one that I actually wrote up for, and I kept a copy of it. And we kept insisting there was a grievance. And even the correctional investigator was convinced by correctional services there wasn't a grievance. And I finally went to them and said, look, here it is. 
I put it in the grievance box. This is the copy. And that's when they finally disclosed that they hadn't opened the grievance box for three months. So absolutely. I mean, if it sounds like we've solved or any of this is solved, I, I appreciate you raising that, Mary, because I think there are very real issues around what needs to be happening um, there and around confidentiality, and even more so in the provincial and territorial jails. I mean, um, breaches of human rights happen on a daily basis. If I had a lawyer for every single woman, I'd have a court case for every single woman right now, and man, for that matter. And so, I, you know, it, anything I've said, if it sounds like I think they're, they're, it's solved in those ways, um, please don't hear it that way. I mean, I, I do think there are reasons. To, I was trying to find the positive of where we're moving, but there's huge work to be done, so yes. Sorry, I have to play the role of the man right now and shut, shut down what is uh, sure to be a lively conversation so that we clear the room when we're supposed to. But let me say just a couple of um, mm -hmm. words first. We're actually going to continue to draw on him uh, starting at 22 uh, the hour as law students are invited to go up and talk to her about uh, her career path in social justice advocacy up in the faculty lounge. So that's happening after this. For those of you who want to come up and speak a moment uh, in the next few minutes. Before that, I invite you to do it. I also want to take the chance to mention our next seminar, uh, which is coming up on Friday, November 15th. That's Joanna Erdman and Tamar Adair talking about human rights education in the health professions, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And finally, I want to uh, thank, once again, uh, our speaker, Kim Kate, uh, for her devastating uh, talk today uh, and for bringing, uh, I guess, bringing to life uh, the story of Ashley Smith and others uh, and reminding us of our responsibility for what happened uh, in those cases and for what continues to happen uh, in the prisons so long as we don't uh, act. Okay, thank you, Kim. Thank you.